Good morning. You're going to get some steps. And don't worry. Thank you for the introduction. IRIS, that Institute for Sustainability thing, which I used to call that sustainability thing we do, until one of the vice presidents said, stop calling it that. I said, oh, the name is too long. And if it, Dawn is fine as well, because um, I have a Z in my name, and I find people with Zs in their name, people have trouble saying them. So it's Baisley, but it doesn't look that way. But don't worry about it. So thank you very, very much for inviting me to be here. Gabriella, finally, we meet in person. I've known her through Twitter for years. So I'm going to take a very short time to talk a little bit about the challenge that every academic researcher or every NGO staff member who's trying to get action in some way, uh, or every government employee who's trying to get movement, or corporate employee, if you are the director of sustainability for a big coffee company, you want people to change what they're doing to be more sustainable. And uh, you have knowledge and studies and data that you want to give to people and have them listen to it and take action. But the problem is that we know from all the research at places like the Yale University Climate Consortium that you can give people a lot of facts to say that climate change is real and they don't believe a word of it. They're not going to change. So how do you engage with your stakeholders to trust and to have more of a knowledge co-production and an exchange of information rather than you being the expert and saying, you're going to do what I'm going to tell you because I have a PhD or something. So we need to get some skills, and these are this is experiential. I've had to learn this the hard way over 30 years of working with different interdisciplinary groups, uh, first on forests and grassland um, management and geese and shooting deer and this kind of stuff, um, and then um, around climate change action and sustainability and garbage recycling. So how do we respect diverse ways of knowing? How do we navigate the tendency of people to want to be the expert and have other people listen to them rather than hear what other people have to say? So how do we actually do that? Well. In fact, we listen, and this is something that I have been told by many, many elders and colleagues who are First Nations and Indigenous peoples. They talk about getting together and talking and listening. So this, for me, has been a really vital, vital lesson that I tell to all of my academic colleagues, is you have to learn to listen. So I want to start this talk by acknowledging and thanking the Inter-American Institute and the University of Calgary for hosting this. Thank you very much. And the AAAS. I'm sorry, I should have put you up there. Apologies for that. Um, and also, I want to acknowledge that we are on the territory of the Blackfoot people and the Métis people as well. So this is something that you would never have seen um, a few years ago at universities. You would have never seen this kind of acknowledgement. But now, as we understand that there is a lot of work to be done with Canada's Indigenous people, this is an important step that we have to take. And this is something about respecting different ways of knowing. And once you start doing this, it really changes the way you actually interact with people. So we're here at a transdisciplinary conference because we assume that interdisciplinary collaborations and transdisciplinarity are a good thing. Guess what? We may feel it's a good thing, but the hard data and research to say that this is a way of generating innovative solutions to wicked problems of the world. In fact, until very recently, there was very little information of a peer-reviewed academic nature to show that this actually was something. And I know some of you are now going to the Science of Team Science uh, conferences where this is something that's been taken up. And um, if you want to join the listserv, this is a great, some people here are on that listserv, right? Join the listserv, great stuff comes out all the time, all the latest research on the benefits of interdisciplinary collaboration. It's a great thing, I'll, I'll, I'll give this to you. 
Um, I think one of the things that we don't always think about when we join interdisciplinary groups is that every team will have a different culture and a different set of expertise. So I have worked on many groups where there have been NGO members, government staff, and academics from biology. These would be conservation biology groups, managing national park uh, committees for rare species and so on. But that is a different kind of interdisciplinary collaboration than when you've got um, academics from across the university from different departments and faculties. Every department and faculty and unit has its own culture and its own way of recognizing academic excellence. So I can tell you I was on uh, a committee to identify prest uh, for prestigious awards and there was a physics professor uh, from my university, a woman, she was the leader of a particle physics team of like a hundred people around the world. And she had papers in nature and science, and they were two pages long. She was the first author, the corresponding author, um, and there was 40, 50 co-authors. So my colleagues who were from other faculties, political science was there, Department of History, they said, hmm, she can't be that good because she has a two-page paper in the journal Science. This, what does that mean? Or a five-page paper, I can't remember what it was. I said, hey, oh my God, this is amazing. She's leading this enormous team. She's the author of Correspondence. You should nominate her for this prestigious chair. Um, and likewise, it goes the other way. When we're in the Faculty of Science, I've actually had people say to me that by writing a monograph, writing a book, that that's not a publication. I mentioned this to you. I actually got that feedback from NSERC. Not a publication. So we really have to understand these different ways of producing knowledge and that there's this diversity in the academy. Um, there's a wonderful uh, document. Does everybody know this? Has everyone got this already? Which is the National Institute of Health Collaboration and Team Science Manual. It's available online to download. It is um, all about how to uh, approach working in a collaborative team. And I would, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that you get it, and it's freely available. So they have information in there like factors that develop, that prevent the development of a strong team, um, absence of trust, fear of conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability, inattention to results. And they tell you, they, they give advice and information um, on how to navigate these collaborative um, endeavors, and it's really good. I give it to all the graduate students and undergraduates. Um, we have to recognize that personality types play a key role in team dynamics as we move forward. And one of the things that, um, has anyone done an online personality test? Amaya's Briggs? So there are 16 different personality types. There are extroverts, there are introverts, there are analytical thinkers, there are people who feel it here. They just know, there are, it, it, like emotion is everything. You have to have a feeling. Um, Actually, it turns out that people who tend to be in STEM tend to be a very particular personality type, which is 16% on average. So how are you going to get along with the other personality types? They're not thinking like you. So you have to overcome that. Here's one of my, I love to do these online tests. Um, so yeah, I just put the, the, um, the results. So we have a world of diverse um, people and personalities and different ways of knowing. How do we navigate that? How do you bring that into your work in, on, in these transdisciplinary teams? So just want to go over what's happening with engineering in Canada. Engineers Canada, professional engineers have decided that engineers can do better with incorporating diverse points of view. So they have organized something called the Engineering Change Lab to give approach. So Engineers Without Borders, which is one of um, 
uh, the top groups, it's like Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, they're involved in this, along with um, Engineers Canada. And they're holding these change labs. They want to change the culture of engineering and the way that engineering is, engineers engage with everyday people and everyday people engage with engineers. As my colleague from India, I'll be spending three months with her. She's um, an uh, environmental studies uh, co colleague who, was, who works on um, green energy. Um, and uh, she was there at this event that we went to. So engineers for change, the engineering lab brings in agent provocateur to provoke the discussion, to challenge the group. It's very interesting. And they asked me to come and talk about ecology. My face is here. <coughs> so what happens? when engineers are told that they have to change how they think about things. <coughs> the engineering profession says it wants to diversify, and the Ontario, that's my province, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers decided to allow people with different kinds of qualifications to join the society. So if you had a Bachelor of Applied Science or you were an architect, you could apply to join the Professional Engineering Society. And immediately what happened was 50% of the professional engineers of Ontario dropped their affiliation. I got this story from my friend Marisa, who is a professional engineer and the assistant dean of inclusivity and diversity in engineering at my university. So those people were like, oh, I want to be an engineer, like I know, and I can't deal with this. So um, this, is, uh, this is sort of a, a figure I made. I just threw up this flowchart because ecologists like flowcharts. So what they are now dealing with in the engineering group is the grassroots wants change. So you want to sort of have this, this, this knowledge or these nutrients moving around. The, the rocks, the bedrock, the, the people who, who run the engineering profession and decide who will be a professional engineer, they want change, but they've hit the clay layer in the soil. So everyone wants change and the clay layer are, are like the everyday engineers. And so the question is, how do you actually break some holes in the clay layer to facilitate the movement of the nutrients? I'm a biologist, so I'm going to give you a nutrient thing. Um, so um, how do you do this? So what I want to introduce you to is something that we uh, started doing well, it's going on 10 years ago, and now it's become much more popular. And this is an approach to working with diverse stakeholder groups um, that is called the unconference. So this is what you're all proposing to do, is to work with diverse groups and communities. How do you build trust? How do you get them to dialogue with you? So this is just a photo from, uh, I guess, 2009. And a lot of the women that you can see here were speaking as women who have experienced climate change. Um, they are women that the United Nations um, was sending them on a tour around the world to talk about how climate change is affecting them. So this lady here is from New Orleans. Her home had been wiped out after Hurricane Katrina. And she is, in fact, now she's a community leader in rebuilding. Um, but you know what? She's a beautician. She was the local hairdresser. This lady here is from one of the small island states. This lady here is a farmer in Nigeria. So these are women who have local knowledge who are now touring the world, well, this was 10 years ago, to talk about that knowledge. And uh, we had a chance to hear them and speak to them afterwards. It was very powerful. So the unconference, why do you want to do some weird thing called an unconference? Well, the reason for that is I've seen the, world's, the word stakeholder a lot. Stakeholder, stakeholder, stakeholder. I'm always invited to stakeholder things. I'm going constantly. I have a million stakeholder papers and projects from the government of international government, local, regional, whatever. The problem with stakeholders is when you decide who the stakeholders are, that's your step one. That's your assumption about whose voices should be at the table, who has knowledge. So the unconference allows you to take a step back 
to stage zero or even stage minus one to decide who you may want to be hearing that you didn't think about hearing from. So the unconference, um, uh, I'll, I'll provide, uh, you'll get the slides, I'll, I'll make sure that you have the slides. Okay, you'll have them. Um, let me just go back. So this is the unconference net. Um, it's all over the internet. It's become very popular in the last three years. So the two rules, and we're going to do a little unconference. We're going to do one. I'm going to stop speaking in about one minute. And we're actually going to do an unconference here to give you the idea, because this, is, this works. I can tell you we've done tons of them, um, and they work. Nobody gives a presentation. I just broke that rule. I apologize. Sorry about that. Forget what I'm saying. This is, ignore me, we'll move to that. And then if a session doesn't inspire you, so as you participate in an unconference, you get up and you walk away and you find a conversation that you like. So, so we don't trap people. You're kind of trapped listening to me. I feel free to get up and walk away, right? Just if, if, if you don't like what I'm saying, that's the thing about the unconference. It's about freedom of expression. Um, and that's really what it is, and I'll, I'll go over how we're going to, to organize and try it, because I think it will, even within this group where you've worked together for two years, when we bring in this format, you'll probably be surprised at what emerges. So before I, sh I, I go through what is the unconference format, let me just um, uh, explain a couple of things I found. Look, PLOS computational biology 2015. I was shocked. I googled this today. 10 simple rules for organizing an unconference. It's open access. You can all get it. Um, this is a report that we did. Um, we actually finished it only six, seven years ago. We did it for the government of the Northwest Territories in Canada. They wanted um, to have some community-based protocols for um, dealing with non-indigenous invasive species like insects and plants that are arriving in this part of Canada where population density is very low. And we actually arrived at everything through unconferences. Um, we used most of our budget to hold um, open evenings in several different communities across the Northwest Territories. And they, um, we just gave food and people arrived and we talked to them. Uh, there was, it was very unstructured. And if you go here and you Google unconference and you look at images, you get a whole bunch of stuff come up. So we're going to try an unconference right now. And I think that what you're going, well, you don't know. The great thing about an unconference is if you get up in the morning and you say, I'm feeling like I didn't really organize enough, whatever, oh, I'll do an unconference because you don't actually have to have any organization because the agenda for the next 30 minutes is going to come from you. 